Hello, I'm Dr. John Iskander. Welcome to CDC Beyond the Data. I'm here today with Dr. Paul Mehta, Principal Investigator of the CDC ALS Registry. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Mehta. Thank you, John, for having me here. It's an opportunity and it's, a, it's an honor to be here to actually have the privilege to uh, talk about the registry with, uh, with, with your group. So remind us, start by reminding us uh, what ALS is sure. and how CDC came to be involved in monitoring this disease. Sure. So ALS is a uh, motor neuron disease. It's uh, also known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. It was named after a famous New York Yankees player back in the 1940s who passed away with this disease. Um, CDC was tasked back in 2010 to go ahead and establish a registry. Um, the the uh, purpose of the registry is multifold. So for example, we look at the, the prevalence and the incidence of ALS. We look at the demographics of disease, who gets the disease itself. And we also look at risk factors, what causes the disease, etiology, and so forth. Um, so what have we learned you know, so far about uh, who's at most risk for ALS? And uh, w w what are some of the things we've Sure. learned from the sure. registry so far. So for whatever reason, we're not sure why ALS affects whites and especially males more so than any other group. That's a, that's a quandary out there. It predominantly is a disease of, of, of Caucasian individuals. And it's one of those vexing issues where we want to try to figure out why does it affect males and especially whites more so than any other group. And, and research is currently being done to kind of look at the, the facets of ALS. Um, ALS is uh, two-pronged. So there's sporadic ALS, which is environmentally linked, and there's also familial ALS, which is linked to genetics. So those two areas, or those two facets, make up ALS as a whole. 90% um, of the cases are considered sporadic, and 10 to 15% are considered uh, genetic. Okay, so, so again, um, obviously one of the important reasons we do surveillance for any condition is to, to help get a better understanding of it that, that might lead to, uh, to preventive interventions. Um, so people, I, I think, may have heard about a couple of sort of emerging ideas about risk factor, and, sure. and these involve um, veterans mm -hmm. and uh, certain types of, of professional athletes. Sure. What, what does the data tell us about sure. those types of groups? So, you know, I like to say there are more unknowns and knowns about ALS. It's a, it's a disease where, I mean, it's been around for probably 200, 300 years and even before that. And when so it finally you know, came out to the forefront, this is ALS, these are the symptomology of ALS and so forth, um, and this is who it affects. I think that's where you, know, you start kind of diving deeper into the data itself. Your question regarding veterans as well as athletes is really, really poignant. Um, veterans, for whatever reason, get ALS at a higher rate than, let's say, non-veterans. And so that by itself is really, really, you know, it's, it's, it's troubling and worrisome as well. Um, so for whatever reason, our military veterans um, are at a greater risk of ALS. We're not sure if it's linked to potentially environmental exposures. Um, it's just not known exactly why they get ALS, ALS at a higher rate than non-vets. Considering athletes, um, athletes by themselves, especially uh, football players, um, for whatever reason, uh, we're thinking you know, it may be due to repetitive concussions. Um, that's perhaps somehow um, starting the ALS progression or the start or the insult itself. But we're not sure why football players at this time are getting ALS than, let's say, non-football players. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly very concerning. Uh, football is a, you know, a sport which is loved by many, many individuals and myself. And so it's one of those things where I think we need to go ahead and have more research to figure out exactly what's causing ALS in these population groups, especially veterans and especially athletes. Yeah. And, and I know that, uh, you know, as we saw in, in today's session, uh, the registry actually works with veterans group doing uh, doing outreach to, to promote awareness. Absolutely. So we work with multi-partner groups such as the ALS Association, MDA, Muscular Dystrophy Association, as well as Les Turner ALS Foundation. So we work with these groups as well as the Veterans Administration to go ahead and raise awareness about ALS. Uh, the VA is an important partner. We get our data from the VA regarding veterans who have ALS. And so certainly we try to work with uh, all in individuals who are affected by this disease. Okay, certainly. Um, I, I, another thing many people in the audience may, may have been aware of, um, something that brought a lot of attention to ALS was um, from a couple of years back, the, the, the ice bucket challenge. Sure. I, I guess from your perspective, um, did this bring more cases into the registry? Did it bring more attention to the condition? How, how did it affect 
uh, your work? Sure. Well, ALS is a rare disease. And being a rare disease, sometimes it doesn't garner the attention as, let's say, you know, uh, breast cancer or some of the more commonly associated conditions out there. So the premise is uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge was very, very important to raise awareness about ALS. It certainly raised awareness about the registry. Um, we had more individuals coming to the registry online portal to go ahead and register um, and say they have ALS and take our risk factor surveys. So that certainly was important. And so the Ice Bucket Challenge was instrumental in you know, raising the, the, the national as well as international uh, you know, awareness about this particular disease. I think more attention certainly needs to be done. Uh, Ice Bucket Challenge is probably, I think, two years old now as of this August. And so I think we still want to make sure that we have more attention paid to ALS, especially among the research community and especially among, you know, making sure our, our, the patients are taken care of as well. So. Certainly. Um, so I think many people have this basic concept of public health surveillance mm -hmm. that it is fundamentally about sort of counting cases. Now the ALS registry takes a lot of steps beyond that. You alluded to the, the risk factor surveys, but could you tell us about some of the other initiatives that the registry is involved with? Absolutely. So it's very, very important. We do a lot to just count cases. I mean, you know, looking at the epidemiology, the prevalent prevalence of ALS certainly is very important, but we do a lot more than that. And one of the things we do is we help researchers go ahead and uh, recruit for their clinical trials or their research studies by having them connect with, uh, with, with, our, with our patient pool. And so that's through our notification system, we call it, to go ahead and connect researchers with patients for clinical trials and studies. That certainly is very important, considering there's not that many clinical trials these days for ALS, and the ones which are there uh, are very, very expensive. And so we have a mechanism that allows pharmaceutical companies to come to us and use our registry to go ahead and recruit for these particular clinical trials. Um, another facet is we also fund research. So we fund um, research looking at the etiology of ALS, you know, what causes this disease. So that's very, very important. And more importantly, we just launched the uh, National ALS Biorepository. And the Biorepository is going to facilitate ALS research in biomarker study, environmental um, conditions, environmental uh, risk factors per se, um, as well as looking at the genetics behind ALS as well. And the Biorepository will allow patients to come in opt in for more information, we'll go ahead and send them a packet, and they can go ahead and opt in to receive a, a, a phlebotomist will come to their home and we'll go ahead and um, take their blood uh, and, and their saliva, and that will be added to the biorepository. And we also have a uh, post-mortem collection as well. So for those individuals who want to go ahead and you know, donate their body to science, that's also available as well. So the biorepository as a whole, we feel it certainly will, will expand ALS research down the road and trying to find out, you know, what causes disease and ultimately look for therapeutics for ALS. So again, coming back to one of those kind of fundamental tenets of, of surveillance that you, you want your surveillance to help uh, both learn more about the disease but ultimately to help, to help control it as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. Without surveillance, we're not going to know a what the disease count is, who gets the disease, and possibly as in terms of etiology as well. Surveillance is very, very critical for ALS. Um, so yes, certainly uh, I, I think the ALS registry in, in, in my view sort of stands as really a model for mm -hmm. you know, where surveillance could, could be going in, sure. in, in this century, again, uh, b beyond the, the, the traditional model. Um, sure. So I'd like to, to uh, thank you very much for, thank for you, joining John. us today. Thank you, thank you very much. Please join us next month for Beyond the Data.